Well, that's not good. My old Century 3 autopilot is dead. And now I'm headed to the Atlanta area. Falcon Field, Atlanta Regional. Kind of bittersweet because after today I'm not gonna fly, in fact I'm not gonna see the Bonanza for probably four months. My Bonanza will get the Garmin GFC 600 autopilot. And this is the avionics uh, shop. This is where we do the maintenance and we also do the wiring. We do avionics checkouts. Get done with it, we can check it on the bench. And then we can put it out in the airplane. So the whole system will be the powered whole thing, up here that for is the first correct. time before we can power it, it all up here before plane. we take it in. Mm -hmm. That's correct. We've got your airplane right here. I was just saying, I know this one. Yeah. We've got 70 TB. It's already been brought into the shop. Mikey, what you got going on in here? You taking the interior part? <laughs> Whoa. Check that out. <laughs> That's pretty darn cool. That will be on my yoke, know, replacing the clock that never <laughs> that keeps never time. worked. <laughs> it can go anywhere from 15 minutes to 30 minutes to 45, just depending on the panel work that you're doing. Cutting your average panel can take about 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. You can see through the panel and see what needs to move, what needs to change. That makes complete yeah. sense, yes. It does. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, it's AirVenture 2022. The world's busiest control tower is here right behind me. And uh, I'm on an elevated platform here, uh, courtesy of Lyft Aviation. They were kind enough to allow me to set up the camera here and share with you the rest of the panel upgrade story. There was an announcement made by Aspen Avionics here early in Oshkosh. The cat's out of the bag, so I can now share with you what has really been going on. Here we go. So a normal install goes something like this. You select the equipment that you want, you find an installer who can do that, who's familiar with the equipment and is an authorized dealer for the, the brands you want to install. Then you make a reservation on the calendar, get an installed slot, drop off the plane. Some time passes, can be weeks, can be months, depending on how complex the job is, and then you pick it up. That's not what happened with my plane. The reason is that the equipment I'm installing in, in the configuration that it was installed at was not previously approved or, or even working. And the announcement that was made is that Aspen Avionics and Garmin have been working together to certify a digital interface between the GFC 600 autopilot, you recall from a prior video, that's the autopilot I zeroed in on, and the Aspen Evolution display. Anyone who has that combination of hardware, GFC 600 and Aspen Evolution, can only use an analog interface today, and uh, that somewhat limits what the autopilot can do. Uh, with a digital interface, from here on, you can do things like altitude pre-select or selecting vertical speeds or indicated airspeed targets from the Aspen. You get your, your bugs on the Aspen and it's also sent to the autopilot so that uh, the autopilot can, can fly them. So really taking much, much more advantage of the capabilities of this wonderful autopilot. And my airplane was the test bed for the development and certification. I uh, loaned it to, to Garmin and Aspen for, for these experiments and the uh, shop that I took it to in January, Gartner Low Aviation in Peachtree City, Georgia, uh, Falcon Field, Carl Gartner and his team, they only needed about six weeks for the uh, installation. And since then, since late March, the plane has been with Garmin in their headquarters at the airport in New Century, Kansas. So, a lot of time has passed. It took a little while to uh, iron out some, uh, some glitches in that digital interface or to, to complete it to the point necessary where everything is working. That's been done. The uh, certification package has been uh, submitted for, for TSO and STC for the new software. And as soon as the FAA signs that, I get my plane back. And then I can show you all this equipment in real life. Carl, thank you for welcoming yep. me here uh, this morning. Can you walk me through what's going to happen over 
the next five, six weeks, however long it's going to take, okay. uh, the different phases of a project like this? Well, what we'll do is we'll first start out by, we'll, we'll run the airplane and we'll check all the functions of the, uh, of the uh, systems in the airplane. And once we uh, do that, we'll bring the airplane in. My team will go over the airplane, start uh, depopulating the panel. They'll pull the panel out, pull the whole interior out of the airplane, because we got to pull the whole interior out. Then we get, a, uh, get one of our technicians in and they uh, disassemble all the autopot servos, they remove those. And they pull out all the wiring. While we have another technician starting the wiring on the airplane. Mm -hmm. Then we have Matt and Kayla and Kenny working on your panel information. So we've got a, we got a pretty good team going at the same time. So typically we'll do like a textured black or a textured gray. Mm -hmm. I think I like this one here. You like the gray color? I like the gray color. Do you want the, the textured or do you, would you rather be smooth? Because we have both. Most people do textured. I think it's because it kind of cuts down on glare. Um, yeah, but also thinking that, that there'll be scratches before too long, right? It might be hiding it a little better. Yeah, probably. Yeah, let's do, <laughs> let's do gray textured. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll have one guy that'll sit on the bench and he'll wire up, completely wire up your airplane. He will not be the, the man putting the, uh, the equipment in the airplane or the wiring. He hands it off to another technician while he goes on to another job, mm -hmm. you know. Same way with uh, Kayla and Kenny and uh, Matt. Matt will go through the panel. Then Matt will hand off the panel information to Kenny. Kenny will sit down and draw it up like we showed you right here. Mm -hmm. Then we'll do a CNC plastic panel first. We do a test fit on the airplane. So we make sure everything works through the plastic uh, panel first. Because the metal is expensive. That's it's exactly wrong. right. Yeah. You can think all day long that you're going to cut it right the first time. Mm -hmm. and I can tell you very seldom is that going to happen. <laughs> so it's, it's better just to go ahead and cut the plexiglass panel so you can see how everything's going to fit. Mm -hmm. We'll do a dry fit. We'll put everything actually in the panel and see how it works out. Then if there's any anything that we need to uh, adjust, we can see it there. Um, after we cut that panel, we'll powder coat it, we'll etch it, figure out what, uh, is there any labels that have to be put on there, and instead of labels, we'll etch what needs to be put on the panel. For placards. And that's correct, like that. in the mm -hmm. placards, that's mm -hmm. correct. And then after that, then we start, at that point, we're pretty well ready to start putting the airplane back together. So we start uh, assembling everything back together. We do full function checks before we put the panel in. We'll put all the equipment in the panel sitting there. Then um, at that point, once we figured out everything works, then we start populating the panel back together. And at that point in time, then we put the interior back in. Uh, we'll, do a, we'll do a scale weighing on the airplane, weigh the airplane out. And then uh, after that point, then it's ready to go fly. This is by far the biggest project ever done on my airplane since it's I It's a big it. project. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I've had individual pieces of avionics replaced or added, like an engine monitor right, or correct. the um, you know, the GNS to IFD swap that was pretty straightforward. Uh, but never anything big enough to where the whole setup could be wired and tested outside of the aircraft. I, yes. I, I can see why that uh, is much easier than putting all the equipment in and dealing with the wiring. I agree, it is. It's yeah. a whole lot easier for us to be able to take everything out mm -hmm. and go back with fresh wires. Mm -hmm. in, in the past weeks, we already went over some drafts of yep. what the rough arrangement of the equipment is going to look like, and I'm, I'm very excited about that. But you told me that you, you have a, a computer software here where we'll sit down and, and finalize that. That is correct. Right? That is how, correct. How does that work? Well, that, we'll set you down. It's, it's Panel Planner. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, a program out there that I think a lot of shops may have. Okay, and then put um, four more in a row. Do we know what size? Put them right here. I don't know what size they are. Just make four. Just put the holes there. What, so and what are those for? One's going to say um, glare shield lighting or floodlights. And, and we can sit down and detail it out more. That's another thing that even though we've detailed it out right here for you, and we've done a CAD drawing also. If we've cut it in plastic and laid it all out and show you a picture of it and there's something you don't like, that's the time where we can still go ahead and address moving something around. Or uh, you may say, okay, well, I don't really like that switch there. Let's put that switch over here mm -hmm. now, you know. So 
all that works well up until we cut the metal panel. Yeah. <laughs> Panel lighting. This is new for me, right? Not, right now, everything is elect is mechanical in front of me, yeah. and um, I've never been happy with the with the lighting in my cockpit. You know, different switches for different parts of the panel, yeah. and some work and some don't. And the the floodlight gets so hot that it seems to melt the plastic around it. We we've been do seeing that on a lot of a lot of airplanes, and we've been talking about. And we have actually gone and just put some di some um, transistorized dimmer circuits inside the airplanes uh -huh. and brought the dimmer pots and made and etched it on the panel yeah. and made it look nice and abandoned some of the older style yeah. dimmers. For the for the floodlight, do you have a we can do a, a separate light. Yeah, we can do uh -huh. a separate. I've done some LED lights in those floodlights mm -hmm. underneath, and we can do the same solution. Put a LED. Um, we've done one for um, an A36 here. We actually put red LEDs up underneath it, yeah. and having a uh, having a separate uh, adjustment for that one. Okay. So we've actually separated out just about all the lights that they want to separate it out. That way they can turn up what they want up, what they want down. You know. Yeah. So instead of all the avionics all bright, all of it dim, you know. That way we can. I, I like that. That's, yeah. that's right. Yeah. LED. That's that's really the best way to do it. Because then you can then you can decide. Okay, well, I want uh, my Aspens to be up this bright. Mm -hmm. I want my 750s to be over here. I want my engine monitor to be this bright. You know. Yeah. Instead, you got everything blaring you in the eye. It'll drive you crazy. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, do you want um, a glove box? There is one in it right now. If we. Can I would tell you to it. leave it in there. And what we'll do is we'll do a flush-mounted glove box with the spring, you push on it and it pops open. Oh, okay. It'll also have the uh, Beechcraft B logo engraved on it. Nice. It looked good, so <laughs> we'll, we'll do that. that yeah. That's definitely something that you want. Mm -hmm. And then I'm curious about all the other switches that we need, in particular the ones on, on the yoke. What, what switches Those do you are gonna come. You're, you're gonna get a brand new trim switch, mm -hmm. autopot disconnect. You'll get a uh, control wheel steering switch. All that'll be brand new. Okay. Push to talk. You'll have a go round or toga button. A lot of times I put that close to where the throttle area is uh -huh. because if you're doing a go round, you just hit the button because you're going to have a lot of switches on that yoke. Yes. You know, so to have another switch on the yoke to remember to push, it's easier, I think, to have it by the throttle, kind of like, I don't know if you ever seen people flying in King Airs or some of the other bearings or they got it right there on the throttle. Yes. You know. But on uh, the single engine airplanes, I usually put it up close on the panel to where when you have to go throw it full throttle, you just hit the go around. Forward and then Air, that's correct. That mm -hmm. I yeah. like that. Okay. I was able to stick around for a couple of days after I dropped off the Bonanza over the weekend um, and, and see at least the, the first steps of this big project. And uh, you can see behind me, cowling is open. Uh, part of that is the removal of the instrument pressure system. Uh, no air driven gyros anymore. And the other part is we're doing an annual inspection at the same time, so uh, some work okay, happening uh, as a result of that. There's also uh, some drastic changes that you can see on the inside. All the interiors removed, all the uh, carpets, side covers, uh, etc. And the um, old avionics is uh, in the process of being removed as well. I'm also getting rid of the uh, mechanical six-pack in front of me finally getting an EFIS. A modern autopilot these days needs an EFIS. It needs somewhere to display the information from the navigator, source select, navigation source, and then feed that to the autopilot. And my head, I guess, is a giveaway as to what's going to be in my panel. Hey Martin, welcome to the Aspen family. You're getting a 2500 system, which is all three screens. That's the best thing ever. We can't wait to see it in action and look forward to seeing your content and lots of great videos. Welcome aboard. After I posted the first part of the avionics upgrade video, there were a lot of speculations on uh, YouTube comments and also on Beach Talk as to what was actually going on. Remember, I couldn't disclose before the public announcement the exact nature of the project. Let's see how you guys did. So Walter thinks, not much left to the imagination of the avionics upgrade since we saw the panel cut out. Yeah, I guess you saw the the panel. He's talking about the, the gray versus white. I don't know if there's any research. I just like the gray, so that's why I went for it. 
Looks like you put the 600 up top and center. I like it. Yeah, I, I figured that would be the best location. If you look at any modern jet, whether it's an airliner or a business jet, it has the autopilot uh, mode control panel right in the center under the glare shield. That works for them. That's where I wanted mine. Justin says, I would keep your GPS and transponder and get a G3X Touch. The G3X Touch is, is a really nice uh, panel for this project here because it was part of the STC and, and certification for uh, uh, development for this new project. I, uh, I needed to go with the Aspen, but you know, the, the Aspens are, are really nice in terms of you know, redundancy, uh, simplicity. I um, feel like they have the right amount of information um, in, in, a, in a good form factor. Let's see what else do we have. Here's another vote for two GI 275s with a Garmin Autopilot. Yeah, those 275s are, are beautiful. And what you can do with them is, is amazing. What is Walter saying? Walter says, my bet on Martin's upgrade after this video is now solidly on a new panel, correct? With Garmin equipment to go with the GFC 600, partially correct. Key phrases like long-term integration, full functionality, cost is not the only consideration. Yeah, Garmin is, it's not the cheapest, but they're, they're good. Um, so he his bet is on a Garmin PFD. Nope, GTN, yes. Transponder, yes. May keep the JPI and audio panel, maybe. Well, yeah, I am keeping the JPI, but the uh, the audio panel is, is gonna be the, the Garmin remote mounted audio panel for the uh, voice commands. I think that's a, that's a good feature to add to uh, the rest of the panel. Oh, and here's a comment from Evan. Don't get rid of the six pack. Personally, I think the vintage look of the six pack looks cooler than the glass panel. Yeah, there, there is some, some truth to that. And you know, if I had a, a Piper cup or uh, you know, something, something of that vintage, I think it would be, uh, it would be a shame to take the mechanical instruments out, but you, you would really limit yourself if you had an autopilot like the GFC 600, a modern navigator like uh, the GTNs or the, the IFDs and not have an EFIS to tie the two together. The, the EFIS is really key to connecting the autopilot to the GPS and getting the most out of those two systems. You can't do that with mechanical gauges. All right, let's switch over to Beach Talk. There was a discussion thread there uh, talking about my installation video. I posted it there and uh, there was some back and forth on uh, guesses as to what might happen. Yeah, Murray started it. Martin hasn't stated uh, anything about GTN. So let's have a contest on what he's putting in. Paul says, no way Martin will give up his IFDs. I really like my IFDs. So why am I changing? Well, that has a lot to do with ensuring the best compatibility between the old and, and the new. Uh, wh what I've done in the past is whenever I made an upgrade, I looked at that particular piece of equipment and I tried to pick the best I could uh, for that. For example, when I needed to equip for ADS-B, I picked the Lynx NGT 9000 plus, you know, with the little display for traffic and, and the active traffic option. Not cheap, but I thought it would give me the best solution I, I could get for that function. When my Garmin GNS, the, the old GNS 530 and 430 started aging, I uh, went with the IFDs uh, because um, I loved the user interface. They were easy to retrofit. They were very capable. Uh, very, very good units. And even today, looking back, there is nothing wrong with the IFDs. I really like the IFDs. However, what I failed to see at the time was that um, rather than looking at one piece of equipment at a time, I got to look at the whole system and how different components play with one another. And the combination of a Garmin Autopilot and a uh, Avidine IFD uh, it, it works well for some people. It works sort of for other people. Every now and then you see reports on the web where there are some glitches, uh, some things that, that are not completely reliable. And I really wanted my new setup to be, uh, to be perfect and, and not have any, any such issues or, or even occasional hiccups. Another reason is 
I, I teach as a CFI. I work with a lot of students that have GTNs in their airplanes. And, and while I have basic knowledge of them, I don't understand the GTNs yet uh, you know, the same way that I, that I understood the IFDs after three years of flying them in, in my Bonanza. So a nice side effect of the switch is I hope to now get to the same mastery level understanding of the GTNs that I already have for the IFDs and, and, and use that to help my students. Lance is uh, thinking Dynon. Dynon has a nice PFD. I, I like it, but you know, as I explained in the autopilot installation, I, I do not think their autopilot is in the same league as the, uh, the Garmin GFC 500 and 600. Eric is, took a close look at the panel, uh, and yeah, he, he got a few things right. Three screen Aspen, yes. Staying with JPI, yes. GI275 is a backup. Yep. About the G3X here, your know, Eric said, yeah, the, the, the way that the panel is, uh, is prepared, it, it looks wrong for Garmin. Look at the mounting screw holes, definitely a three screen Aspen. Good observation, Eric. People are getting on board with the three Aspen screens. Uh, Bruce is saying Martin seems to be under non-disclosure agreement. Yeah, about about the the secrecy and you know piecemealing the information. That that's absolutely true. Until Aspen announced the digital interface between the Aspen Evolution display and the GFC 600 at Oshkosh uh, a month ago, I could not talk about that interface, and, and that is the reason why. Um, just now, I, I can tell you the, the full story here. Aspen may update its software to take better advantage of features such as altitude pre-select. That's exactly right. That's what's going on. Jeff is looking at the panel in more detail. Um, not just the mounting holes, but also the switches for left, right, and center. Yep, good observation, Jeff. And there's a push button for Garmin Smart Glide, uh, which, yes, you're right, Jeff, that does require a GTN. So that answers the IFD or GTN question. Well, and then came the day in July at Oshkosh where uh, Aspen made a public announcement. Uh, it was at the Bonanzas to Oshkosh dinner where uh, John Ujikai, the uh, uh, CEO of Aspen, told the Bonanza pilots and, and the world that uh, this was happening and that enabled me to tell the rest of the story here. So glad the news is out. Um, wish the plane was back too, but that's still a little bit ahead. So what's going on right now is at the beginning of June, Aspen submitted the, uh, the application for TSO and STC for their modified software for the Aspen Evolution uh, displays. And normally, I'm told you know, for a minor TSO, that's a you know, 30 day turnaround for the FAA. Now, obviously, early June to early August, uh, it's been two months. And um, my understanding is we don't even have an expected completion date or an expected date when, when the FAA will start looking at it. So, dear viewers, if you happen to work for the FAA at the Chicago Aircraft Certification Office, Chicago ACO, and you find a stack of papers that is titled Aspen Software. Maybe you can take a look at that, move it up a little bit in the pile, because my Bonanza 70 Tango Bravo is going to be stuck on the ground. It's going to be AOG until you sign that piece of paper and, and give it back to Aspen. So I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Martin, I can't tell you how excited I am to have you in the Garmin family. In your airplane, we've installed a GFC 600 Autopilot, dual GTN 750 XIs, an active traffic system, a Garmin GI275. You're going to have amazing integration with this setup, and we think that it's going to transform your flying. We're here standing in front of the GFC 600, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing on your airplane, November 70 Tango Bravo. So we brought your aircraft, your Bonanza, into our flight test hangar. And what we're doing with it while it's here at our Olathe flight test facility is we are doing Aspen and GFC 600 digital integration. We've established this A-Rink 429 connection, and it's going to provide you with all of the integration benefits that you've come to expect 
out of a modern integrated autopilot solution. So we're super excited about it. And I'm just gonna take you through a little bit of a tour on what we've done with your Bonanza while it's been here. So first we, we bring the airplane in, we inspect the whole installation, we make sure that it conforms with our installation manuals and our data, and then we start doing flight tests. So we take that airplane up and we're going to basically exercise every bit of the autopilot and, and integration envelope that we can and we're going to find out any, if there's any bugs, any kinks, or any problems with the, uh, with the integration. Uh, so that, that effort has been completed now, and we are through the development. We've basically debugged the whole thing. It's working great. Your airplane's flying great, and we're really excited to get this out there into the field. Uh, we know that uh, Aspen users are really desperate for our autopilot. It's, it's recognized as an industry leader, and we want to uh, help those owners out and get that autopilot out to them. All right, so I'm standing right here in front of our kiosk. We've got the GFC 500 and 600 shown. For your Bonanza 70 Tango Bravo, you've selected the GFC 600. And I'm super excited to, to take our viewers through a few uh, features of this autopilot. So first of all, it's a fully modern 21st century digital attitude-based solid state autopilot. Uh, and I'll start with uh, my favorite feature about this autopilot, which is the servos. So we're going to show you the GSA 87 servos down here. These are brushless DC motors. They don't have a mechanical slip clutch or a shear pin uh, that can cause uh, extra maintenance or, or an additional failure method. They offer positive engagement and disengagement. And when the system is off, you won't feel that residual torque that you, or, or forces that you might feel with an, with an airplane with a mechanical override system. As far as the, the uh, digital integration of this autopilot, this autopilot does offer a standalone built-in AHARS solution, so your attitude source is going to come right out of the mode controller in this case. Uh, and, and that standalone operation allows for installation with a variety of, of other cockpit equipment, say for instance like this Aspen display. We've also got shown here the uh, GI-285 mode enunciator. So if, you're, if you don't have a Garmin display to enunciate modes, don't worry, we've got you taken care of. You can use this uh, GI-285, and we're really super excited for you to experience this autopilot in your Bonanza firsthand because we know you're gonna love it. By the time we got to Sun and Fun here in early April, I was able to reconnect with Carl and his team from Gardner Low and get an update on what had happened to us. I have not flown the plane since then. So, you know, once we got done talking and you left the airplane with us, we went in and we all discussed how we are going to lay everything out. We brought the airplane in. We took the panel apart, right? Took all your wiring out. We basically gutted your airplane. Kenny got involved, laid out the panel and everything. Kayla was involved. So she, she helped uh, with some of the engineering. Matt did too. So we went through, and we also did an annual on the airplane. No, While they were doing all that, correct, we were doing an annual on the airplane. We went ahead and found that there were some gear things that need to be addressed. We took care of the gear if issues. And so once all that was taken care of, we figured out and established what you were going to do totally on the airplane. Went ahead and installed the autopilot servos. So that was a lot of structural work we had to do. Once we got done with those, we, we proceeded on with the, with the wiring of the airplane. So for the most part, the whole panel layout process went pretty smoothly. Um, the pilot panel, co-pilot panel, everything was perfect pretty much the first time around. What, what, what gave us fits was the lower panels. Your circuit breaker panel, for example, the holes for that, I guess, back when your airplane was manufactured, those holes were hand drilled. So they're not perfectly spaced out and perfectly even. So uh, I actually made I made the, the circuit breaker panel the first time around and we fit it up there and certain things were not want, certain circuit breakers were not wanting to fit in there. Uh, your, your landing gear lights weren't wanting to fit right. So I ended up having to make it again because if we kept the original, we would have had to basically expand all the holes and they wouldn't be quite as tight as we like it to look so everything's really you know neat and pretty looking so I ended up making that panel a second time um, and that was really the only thing that gave us fits uh, I did when we first started the project 
uh, one of the things we like to do to kind of tie everything in is the little plate that goes in the middle of your yoke, which I'm sure you remember. Um, we made it gray originally to match the interior of your airplane. But after we got your yoke covered in, in brand new leather and we repainted the, the yoke arm and everything and it was black, we thought the gray didn't quite look right. So we ended up having to go back and make you a new one so that everything kind of tied in perfectly together. And what was cool is that the gray panel and the black, uh, the yoke stuff and all the, the black screws on the panel, it kind of had like this gray and black. Uh, color scheme going on where everything was kind of accented perfectly so it all ended up working out in the end but just little hiccups like that here and there nothing too serious uh, we were very excited to work with Martin uh, on this project in his A36 uh, we we're excited to work with both Garmin and Aspen and this collaboration and getting this uh, these components to work together um, we worked closely with Martin to design an instrument panel that we thought he would be happy with and then we set to out to creating something. Um, there was some snags along the way, making these different manufacturers' components talk and doing these interfaces that have never been done before. But ultimately, we overcame it and we got everything to talk the way it should. Um, we are proud of the finished product, and we think Martin's going to enjoy it for years to come. Um, this is something that we do on a regular basis, and we, we love doing it. So, Martin, we're so excited about your interface with the Garmin GFC 600. It's going to be epic 2500 system, GFC 600, all the bells and whistles, but we're going to get altitude pre-select, indicated airspeed control, vertical speed, flight director bars. Boom! It's going to be amazing. All right, that's it for today from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, as always, look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you for watching. If you liked it, please hit like and subscribe. Special thank you as always to my supporters on Patreon. Uh, you guys and gals make, help make this possible and I appreciate it very much. Take care, fly safe, and see you soon with a new panel. Bye-bye.